Good morning and welcome again to the Augusta Community Church in the Dearborn Chapel as we present another uh, message out of Hebrews as we continue in this series. Um, we've had a great fall here in Montana and in Augusta. We've had a lot of warm weather and been able to uh, rake up all our leaves and get them taken care of. And now as I look out the window, uh, it's snowing right now. Uh, the snow is coming down. I think we've already have about six or eight inches on the on the ground. The little bit I've, that I've shoveled, and I've got more to do later on. And you know what that means? When the snow comes, it means that there's no more iced coffee. It has to be hot coffee now. So I hope that you have your coffee or your drink with you. You're in a good setting, a uh, place where you can sit and you're comfortable. That you have your Bible. That's important. That you have your Bible with you right now, and uh, and turn to chapter ten. Of Hebrews and I want to read to you uh, the verses 26 through 39 of that chapter we're going to go through that today and I want to do it in a little different style but first I want to I want to read those verses to you so if you have your Bible uh, if, if you don't pause this for a moment and go get it uh, if you do turn to chapter 10 of Hebrews and follow along with me as I read starting in verse 26 and uh, and I'm reading again out of the New American Standard Version if you have that version, it makes it a little more simple to follow along. Not that it's the only good version. I understand that. It's just the one that we use here at the church so that uh, we try to have everybody on the same page and um, in the same language on the verses. makes it a little easier to follow along and understand. So here we go. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26, says this, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a pub public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that as we uh, dive into your word this morning, that you are with us to, in the, in the person of your Holy Spirit to guide us and to teach us, to make us aware of what it says and how it applies to our own lives. I pray that everyone listening to this message this morning would have no distractions, would be able to think clearly and, and look at your word for what it says and take it in. Lord, there are many around us who uh, try and uh, take apart the Word of God, your Word, Lord, and, and say that it doesn't mean anything. But we who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ uh, have experienced that salvation, that freedom from sin, and we know that your Word is true. And so we ask you to take it today and use it in our lives. And we thank you for this time and ask that your blessing would be upon it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. It's interesting as you go through the Bible, and especially as you read through the Gospels, when you read the, the stories that Jesus tells, it's so often Jesus uses a story to convey a truth to us. And often he uses parables to convey to us uh, the message of the Gospel, uh, the sinfulness of man, and the redemption that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ, God himself who came here to earth. Uh, years ago, there was a novel written. The title of it was A Simple Plan, and it was written by Scott B. Smith, made into a movie in 1998. 
The plot centers around three men who find a crashed airplane deep in the woods, in a snow snowbound woods. Inside, they find four and a half million dollars and a dead body. The simple plan is to take the money and one of them will hold on to it until they are sure no one is looking for it. Or if the authorities come looking for it, they will give it back. But after what they feel is an appropriate amount of time with no inquiries, they will split the money evenly. That's the simple plan. But as you might guess, the simple plan quickly gets complicated because of things that come about in all humans, things like greed and distrust. And as a result, murders ensue. Seeing the movie might generate the thought of what you and me might do in similar circumstances. We would say, of course, we wouldn't betray our friends. We wouldn't become greedy. We wouldn't become distrustful of all who knew our secret. We would never murder, would we? The reality of life is that evil stalks every heart and the right conditions can set it into motion. We can so easily fool ourselves into thinking we are the very, very one who would not be seduced by our own or the world's treachery. As we read the Gospels and we take in the parables that Jesus shares about the hearts of people, wow, you could almost think this modern novel and movie could have been a parable that Jesus would have told. When we think of that, the evil that stalks our hearts and we can all succumb to it. Is there a remedy that can keep us as we go through certain situations we may encounter? Is there a remedy that can keep us from succumbing to the evil that stalks our hearts? And as Christians, we say, of course, our remedy is to have a mind and heart that undergoes a supernatural change, a change where thoughts of greed and jealousy, anger, even fantasy anger, uh, bitterness, lusts of all sorts, become thoughts and actions of the past. A change where our faith in Christ, our focus on God's word, our submitting to the Holy Spirit, all produce in our very being a newness of peace and satisfaction, calmness in all kinds of circumstances, a truth that comes out of us combined with a new care and love for others around us. And all of that because of Christ's love for us that we've experienced. The author of Hebrews, through his words and use of illustrations, is calling us to such a change and to such a life, a life for the glory of God and for our eternal salvation. God speaks through this book. Uh, this morning, let's take a quick overview of what we have studied. And remember, we've titled our study of Hebrews, Remaining Secure in This Insecure World. And lately, I've been saying the last week or two, God has spoken. How are we responding? And in thinking of the story I just told and the words uh, uh, that were said, we need to remember it's God that can change our hearts. And that's what the author in Hebrews is, is trying to tell us. And he tells us that from the beginning. So in this overview, I want to start in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Now, that verse takes me, and I hope it takes you, to thinking about a lot of different things. But one of the things is taking us right back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Uh, do you know that the gospel starts in those first few chapters of Genesis? And, and as you read that and, and know the New Testament... It's good for us to understand those things and, and say, yeah, I believe this. The good news of Jesus starts right there. I, I want to take a moment to insert a little advertisement because uh, this Monday, tomorrow evening, we start our Monday evening class where we're going to be looking at what we call gospel reset and looking at the gospel as it starts in the very book of Genesis and gets us thinking about how we convey the message of the gospel to people who have no idea of the Bible and what its message is. Uh, a new generation of people who we have to have a new way of speaking the same truth of God's message. But chapter 2, though, verse 1, for this reason, as God has spoken to us, we, you and me, 
must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. You know, in our world today, there are so many voices that have been speaking into our lives from the very beginning of our lives until now. There's so many voices that have been speaking different things. Where are those things taking us? But as we come to God's written word, have we paid attention to what he's saying, what he's trying to tell us? And often it's counter, it's countercultural. What do we choose to believe? It's very important that we are carefully making our choices and, and pay careful attention to God's word. Chapter 3, verse 13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, in here, we, we're looking that we need Christian community. And, and in that Christian community, we come together with hearts that are humble, hearts that are honest, and directed towards biblical truth. And we're encouraging one another in that. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. You know, our faith as Christians, uh, so often we, we get mocked that our, we're, it's a blind faith. It's not a blind faith. True faith comes from confidence in and obedience to God's word, the substance of what it says, the experiences that we've had because of that, the affirmation of the Holy Spirit in our life. And, and it comes to us in, in, in the circumstances and consequences that uh, those circumstances bring. God speaks, we hear, we obey, we rest in him. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Jesus' suffering made him Savior. Our obedience to him, even in perhaps our suffering, defines us as his children. Chapter 6, verse 11. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Together in community and even alone in God's words, we run the race and we have an assurance of our salvation. Chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Your life and my life is constantly on the mind of Christ as he cares for us, as he sits, as we've talked to before, spoken about before, at the right hand of the majesty on high, our high priest. Verse, or chapter 8, verse 1. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. You and I right now as Christians, and no matter what circumstances we are in, whether it's the politics of the day, the dissensions of the day, the divisions in our nation, uh, relational problems we may be going through in our own families or with friends, um, illnesses that are in our lives, uh, frailties that we en encounter. In essence, you and I can be encouraged. Jesus is in place in the heavens as our defender. Chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus' finished work is it's not external. It's not just a, a facade, but it's internal in changing our very heart's desires. In chapter 10, verse 10, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. You know, last week, we went through chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. And in those verses, it says this, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, remember we talked about let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We looked at those five ideas out of those last verses that we need to have in our lives that will strengthen us and affirm our faith more and more. And now today we want to go on and, and we want to finish this chapter, but we want to get some things out of it that are important. And so we start in verse 26, where it says, For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Here's another warning that comes to us. In the verses we looked at last week, there was the encouragement to live in confidence of coming into the holy place in, in prayer, to draw near in full faith, with pure hearts, holding fast the confession of our faith, encouraging one another. But now comes this warning, this fourth warning. Here we are told that a believer who knows the truth of Jesus Christ and yet goes on knowingly, willfully, into areas of sin is facing, facing what? Well, verse 27, facing a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries, a quote from Isaiah 26. As we read in verse 31, it will be a terrifying experience to fall into the hands of the living God if that person has rejected him and violated with scorn his standards. In this passage, all, all, all the time, the, the author is speaking first to the Hebrew Christians of that day, to whom, whom uh, are continuing on in temple worship and the practice of offering sacrifices, even after learning of Christ's fulfillment of the law and becoming the once and for all sacrifice for sins. And if so, these people, the author is telling them, they're trampling on Christ's atoning work, saying through their actions that his sacrifice was not enough. Whereas before Christ, the sacrifices were required and were good, now they are sin that will bring judgment from God himself. But he's also speaking to us today as we are people looking at this passage and should be aware, aware of the warning that it brings, a warning that is a continuation of warnings which began back in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where we were told, don't drift away. Continued in three, chapter 3, verse 7 into four thirteen of doubting the word. If you drift away, you're going to start doubting the word. And if you're doing those things, then in chapter 5, verse 11 into 6, becoming dull towards the word and lazy in our spiritual lives. Now, in these, these verses, we're given the fourth warning to us believers and also to those who have heard the good news and rejected it. And so for the believer who has experienced the grace of God through faith in Christ, willful sin is an arrogant affront to our Lord as the person, as the person would be playing with costly and precious mercy and grace allotted to them. For the believer, the only way out of judgment from that is to come before the Lord and plead for undeserved mercy like King David did in Psalm 51. And it's there for, for us. For those who heard the truth of God's Son, who have understood the gospel and yet still reject it, they should be aware, they should be fully conscious that to reject Jesus Christ leads to an eternal judgment of which there is no out. In our lives today, we can confess sins repent and we may be made clean, but the ultimate rejection of Christ leaves a holy, just, righteous God, no alternative for the individual who does that. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have, having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. 2 Peter 2, verse 21. Go on to verse 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, verse 29, how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? In the Old Testament, anyone who sinned willfully had no sacrifice as a recourse. Death at the hand of the people was the final solution. We no longer put people to death for rejecting God and sinning against him. In fact, we do all we can and pray for the Holy Spirit to intercede in the person's life so that they can come to belief or faith for living faith. 
but I know it's not popular to talk in these days of God's judgment towards those who reject his son. But think on this. If, in fact, Jesus is God's son who came into the world and gave his life to save us from sin, sin whose sting, whose ultimate sting is death, how could there not be judgment from him to those who reject such a sacrifice and such a love that's open to them? Verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For a person who has put all of their time and effort, all of their faith in living life on their own, our minds cannot comprehend the terror of what it will be like to awaken in eternity and find that the God you rejected does in fact exist. And the way of salvation he has prescribed as God, was indeed your only hope, and you missed it. I don't say that lightly. My heart bleeds for people who are missing God's precious gift of salvation. I'm not trying to be a, a, a mean pastor. In fact, my heart is concerned, and so much so that I need to tell the truth of this message, that people will get it before it's too late. But now the author turns in verse 32 to a note of encouragement. But remember the former days when, after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Now, in these verses, we're to be encouraged. Uh, do you remember the joy and excitement you knew when you first came to understand and grasp Jesus as Savior? I do. I remember back in those days when I first really committed my life to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, it's time for me to live for you. And there was an exuberance and excitement in me to do that. And now, years later, in this age I'm at, getting ready to file for Medicare, I still feel that. And I want that always. Oh, maybe some made fun of you. Maybe some did of me. Maybe some still do. But as Christians, as followers of Christ, we need to remember and keep our eyes on the fact that we've joined a great company of believers who have gone on before us. 34, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. We pray for those who are imprisoned all over the world because and persecuted for their faith. And in Christ, uh, we give gifts towards helping them. We give knowing that far more is in store for us in heaven. Verse 35 and 36, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Don't throw away that confidence that started at the beginning of your journey with Christ. Hang on to it. Stay with it. How do you do that? You stay in his word. You dismiss those voices of doubt and fear of mocking and you look to God and you ask the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, to witness to your spirit the truth of what you're reading. Verse 37, For yet in a very little while he who is coming will come. He who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith and if he, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Listen, these times that you and I live in are, to say the least, difficult. Of course, some have gone through trials for their faith that we cannot imagine. Maybe some of you have that I can't imagine. But our trials, our tensions, our stresses are getting harder. We need to look to endure, look to what is promised. Habakkuk 2.4 is what is quoted in those last verses. And it's also quoted in Romans chapter 1. It's quoted in Galatians chapter 3 and now here. And the emphasis on that, on that verse, as it's quoted here in Hebrews, is on live by faith. The reality is that evil stalks every heart. And the right conditions can set it into motion. We can so easily fool ourselves into thinking we are the very one 
who would not be seduced by our own or the world's treachery. But we found the remedy to that. We found the word of God. We found the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we've come to faith and belief in Jesus Christ as the source of our redemption, the source of our salvation. Verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to what? To the preserving of the soul. You, you and I, all of us, together in community, or oftentimes and hopefully every day, alone in our times with the Lord, or out in the world where we work, where we live, we press on. We see the brevity of life here and the never-ending horizons of eternity. We set our sights to live for both hand in hand with Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. My prayer today is for each one of us, myself included, to keep our eyes on what is coming, on an eternity with Christ, but to keep our eyes also on the life where we live right now, that we walk hand in hand with Jesus Christ, and he preserves us, he strengthens us, he helps us. Let me once again leave you with this benediction from Jude, verses 23, 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. May your day today be a blessed day as you spend time with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.